very patient, brother. Mm-hmm. He sat there listening to you all this <laughs> patiently, but we about to go in. The brother laid the groundwork. He's about to go heavy into it. You know, I'm not going to, I don't even know what he's going to do. I'm going to learn right now from with him. Brother Infudishi is going to yeah. break down magical chemistry. E.M. Hotep. E.M. Hotep. Uh, before I start, I'd like to ask permission for my elders who are here. Speak. Start, my brother. Thank you, sir. Speak. Um, I'm going to pass something around. This is a sacred blue lotus. This is what was taken by the ancients before they entered the temple. It, the idea was to alter your consciousness so that all the outside world would be left outside and you were ready to join the ancestors that exist within you. And so your consciousness rose. That was the reason for the incense and, and the sacred oils and stuff. And so we get ready to take a magical journey. I just want you to take bit and roll it on your wrist and rub your wrist together. Because it's going to be, every once in a while when I go in real deep, I'm going to say take a sniff. <laughs> so rub it on your wrist and pass it around. Okay. I'll let you know how hard he's going to put it on you. Iem <laughs> Hotep. Okay. Uncle Jasenev Nev. We are divine spiritual beings having a divine human experience. And most of us leave the word divine out. We have to regroup. Brother Kabbalah began to break down who we really are. Some of us don't even know it. Even those of us who are African historians, even those of us who think we're up on it, we don't really know who we are. Look at we are the essence of the cosmic universe. We are the black plasmic matter that exists, exists within our blood. Your blood is liquid crystal. You are a dynamic human being capable of things beyond your comprehension. When they look at the smallest particle in the universe, a quark, it appears and vanishes, appears and vanishes. And it vanishes and appears based upon the observer to let you know that the creator is observing itself through you. That's how powerful you are. Mm. And we're ready at this time, 2012, we were talking with uh, Reverend Clemson, and he was saying we have to pay attention to this number Mm -hmm. because so many people have made reference to it. But brothers and sisters, 2012 is here now. You can see things happening. The magnetic poles are changing and shifting. You see volcanoes, tsunamis. You see earthquakes. You see things moving at an accelerated rate. The weather's going crazy. Things are happening. Some of this is not just based on the Wazungu, the European Caucasians who are trying to survive in the 21st century when their time is up. A lot of this is mother nature, mother father nature regrouping itself for the next millennia. Put it on. This Aquarian age. And so brothers and sisters, you need to be prepared. Don't get caught with your pants down. You heard Brother Kava saying there's a lot of y'all showing your pants because your elders show their pants. Pull your pants up because if your pants is down, you ain't going to be able to get away. Be prepared for the worst. If it doesn't happen, then you are just set in prison. But if it does, you are prepared. Get to a place where you can go at least 90 feet above sea level. Make sure you can get there with your family and have supplies of water and food. Because things are ready. Start preparing yourself with silver and gold and copper. Because you're going to have to barter for things. Food. Remember, we built the pyramids with no money. The greatest human resource, economic resource you have is your spirit, your human energy. And collectively, we represent an infinite reservoir of richness. And so we have to begin to uh, harness that energy so that you can be able to use it when time is necessary. Magical Kemet, you noticed uh, me and Professor Small were talking one day, and he was saying, you know, as we travel all around the world, everybody's fascinated with ancient Kemet, which we call Egypt today. But Nobody's more fascinated with it than Africans in America. Come on. Africans on the continent are not that fascinated about Kemet. 
they've almost been programmed that this is somebody else. But Africans in America, we know this is us. And so me and Professor Small were, we were building. And as we began to analyze African movement on the continent, we noticed that around the time that Africans were kidnapped from the continent and brought to the Caribbeans and dispersed throughout the diaspora to America, that that was the same time that we had this invasion of Eastern Africa. And these Africans had to flight for their life. We know that some of our chiefs and generals in their indigenous cultures sold some of our people, bartered our people off. But they didn't barter necessarily the people in their immediate village. What they did is they went out and got people who were just migrating, who were just passing through, who were just coming. We were coming from the valley, coming from the Hopi Valley. We got caught in this transatlantic trade, slave trade. And so many of the Africans that are dispersed throughout the diaspora are people of African descent who actually come from the Hopi Valley. And so we got the Netaru in our blood. We are the Netaru. I have conversations with people. They don't know the Madu Netra, but they can feel it. They identify with the Netaru. They have dreams that they were the divine beings in other lifetimes. Your sister raising her hand. Amen. I get to testify witness. A lot of us feel that. And we have a young brothers, hip hoppers and stuff. They got all these symbols tattooed on their body. They don't even know what it means. But they got the angst and wings of Ma'at all tattooed all over because they feel this energy. We are these divine beings, the greatest civilization in the modern world. And I say the modern world is anything after 10,000 uh, 10, years ago, the last ice age. The last ice age put an end to several golden ages that existed on the planet Earth. Planet Earth goes through these cycles. Uh, Brother Kaba broke down, for example, in the pyramid text, they talk about how they have been taught plotting three sun years. A sun year is approximately 26,000 years, the whole procession of the equinox. And so if we plotted three sun years, more than 75,000 years, we had to be into the science long before that to create the math to plot it. We created the first star charts. We created star charts of the heavens before most people were born on any other planets, on any other continents. So I need to be real clear. We were doing agriculture. We were smelting iron. See, one of the things you don't know about ancient Kush, that it was the first world smelting of iron industry in the world. And so those people who smelted iron were called Shimsu Haru, followers of Haru. And they were the blacksmiths. And we don't get a chance to talk about this. In Dr. Van Sertiver's books, Blacks in Science, he talks about an uh, iron smelting machine approximately in the area of Kenya, Tanzania, that was smelting iron at temperatures where you can create steel, which wasn't created for Europeans until about 150, 200 years ago. We were doing it before or parallel to ancient Kim. Come on. You, I'm going to show you some slides and some pictures of some stones that are almost as hard as diamond, diorite, that's perfectly carved. And they told you that the ancient Egyptians only had copper and tin tools. You can't, you need diamond cutters to cut this. So I'm trying to tell you, ancient Kemet started out almost at its height. It started out where America won't reach into another 500 to 1,000 years. That's how dynamic we are. And ancient Kemet began to decline each generation. Uh, one of my former teachers, uh, Dr. Asa Hilliard, broke down that we have to redefine our story. And so he broke it down to the first golden age, the second golden age, the third golden age, and the fourth golden age. And so dynasties were created uh, by our uh, European Caucasians during the Greek era, when Manetho was explaining our story to the Greeks. They broke everything up into family groups, so a dynasty is just a family group, okay? And uh, so it's not 10 years, like a decade or a century, like, you know, it's just, it could be eight, a dynasty could be eight years, a dynasty could be 100 years, a dynasty could be 200 years. It's that family rule, okay? So those are fictitious. They have nothing to do with ancient Kemet. Teach. So I need to make that clear. 
They have nothing to do. Uh, Akhenaten didn't know he was the 15th in the suit of the 18th dynasty. <laughs> okay, I need to make that clear. All right? So it's clear. Uh, what we have is the reunification of ancient Kemet approximately the date around 4240 ST, which is equal to the year 1, uh, no, 4240 BCE. 4240 BCE is equal to the year 1 ST, Semitawi. That's the beginning if you are darting, uh, charting things from the civilization of ancient Kemet. But year one is the reunification of Kemet because that's the golden, so that's the first golden age in the modern era. But we can see heirlooms, heirlooms of other golden ages that came before. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of uh, Taneta uh, Anu, who was an African ruler that ruled about 7,500. BCE. And this is still 3,000 years before Kemet to let you know we were still ruling this golden ages, but they don't have the records as they still unearth things. They're, they're going deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole, you know, to see exactly just how old we are, or just how old our civilization. But they can't tell you all of this because the great question comes up is where were they? Get it. Right, you know? So they have to begin to talk about, well, were the Germans here? Were the French here? Were the British here? No! Not even on the planet. <clears throat> and so, therefore, they're not going to put a lot of that information out. They might just say it's pre-dynastic. Like some of these bowls that were carved out of diorite that's a 9.0 on the hardness scale. Go back to the a golden age that preceded the last great flood. And I need to tell people, you need to study topography and geography if you want to even have an inkling of understanding history. I know today they don't even teach geography anymore. They throw it in with social studies. And that's to keep you ignorant. They don't want you to know anything about the planet Earth. You are the planet Earth. You are the essence of this planet. You are a carbon-based unit based on copper and iron. That's in your blood. European Caucasians are ammonia-based people. And you will know that if you ever got caught in the elevator with them. Okay. So now, I want to drop some things down. My divine brother Kabo talked about language. Some of y'all will get that in the morning. Um, talked about language. How a language is the expression of a culture. Your culture is not to teach you just to survive, but it teaches you how to flourish. So when you're out of your culture, you are out of your living mind. And it's very dangerous when somebody else defines your thought pattern. Dr. Amos Wilson used to tell us that our colonizer has given us their desires. Mm. Thank you, Tom. So even the most Afrocentric of us mm -hmm are recovering addicts of white male domination. Mm. Now you know if you're an alcoholic and you haven't had a drink in 10 years, you're still a what? Alcoholic. You're just a recovering alcoholic and haven't drank. I'm saying that anybody in this room, if you've been educated by Europeans, been indoctrinated in any of their uh, religious institutions, if you've been to their, if you are a movie addict, a television addict, radio addict, if you are in love with English, if you, and, 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 if, and if this is the only language you know, then you're an addict of white male domination. Put it on. You might be at a suicidal state. You might be responsible for the destruction of your family and everybody around you. Call it how you see it. And you're afraid to destroy your enemy because you're so much like your enemy, you're afraid to destroy yourself. It is what it is. And that's where we are. And so we have to change our paradigm, change the way we look at things. Think about it. Even your definition of success is defined by your enemy. Your parents told you, get a good what? Job. You don't want a job. You'll be just over broke your whole life. And whose education are you getting? You 
can't get a good education in these universities. And I know, I, mix, I was in them, I got two PhDs and three masters. And what I'm teaching you today, none of it came from their institutions. <laughs> it came from outside studies and books and, 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 and traveling. Brothers and sisters, your best education is to go to the source. Go to the source. So hopefully some of y'all will come with us on May 1st to Boston to look in some of our heirlooms that are locked up in lockdown. All right? Some of y'all can travel to Kemet with us and travel to other places in Africa. But before you travel, you got to get your spatial perspective correct. You're correct. Not your orientation. If somebody's getting ready to orientate you, they're getting ready to bamboozle you. Uh -oh. So when you go to your job and they say you got to go to orientation, you're getting ready to get bamboozled. <laughs> you go to a new school, you got to go to orientation, you're getting ready to get bamboozled. Okay? You need sp proper spatial perspective. So now let me run this on you real quick. Brother Kabul gave you some uh, pictures of the earth, pictures of the Africa. I'm going to change your world just a little bit. I want to change it. Peterson projection is good, but it's not good enough. Not good enough. If you buy the book in Peterson projection, inside of that same book, he has a map like this. And he says, maybe the Australians are not wrong. Maybe they're not down under. Maybe we're upside down. But he can't sell this to the schools or he'll be broke. So he doesn't sell this. He just lets you know that this is probably the proper spatial perspective of the world. See, he's trying to make money. He, he has to send his kids to school. Okay. But this is a proper spatial. So this is how the Africans left the continent. So you begin to see. So up here, I drew Africa. So no, I didn't draw it upside down. You've been upside down. <laughs> the Hopi River, which they call the Nile, does not flow up north. It flows down north. Europe is not above Africa, like they've been telling you your whole life. It's below <laughs> Africa. <coughs> the whole continent, Africa is the only continent between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cor Cancer with the equator almost dividing it directly in half. No other continent has that. That means that you're a tropical and subtropical people. And it doesn't matter that you were born in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago. Within your veins, your DNA, you are still a tropical and subtropical person. So you should be eating like that. Your stomach culture is still that. So I need to just make sure that cool. This word, mahet, means north, but it also means down. This word, the word uh, sut, or sutin, or suti, or rashi, means south, but it also means up. This word, amenti, means west, but it also means right. This word, yabit, means east, but it also means left. We had this plotted before the Europeans knew there was direct directions. Come on. Before the Asiatics came out of their caves and were civilized by us. And so we set up directions. And in order for your west to be on the right side, you have to be facing like this, facing up to the land of where your ancestors come from. But the Kaaba showed you that in this region, in Central Africa, is the origins of where all of us come from. And from there, we migrated to the continent. So you need to be real clear on our migration. And we stayed, when we migrated into Asia and into Australia, we stayed along the coast here. And so all the people along the coast here are people that have melanin. And all out, if you've ever been to Papua New Guinea, you would think you were in the Congo. Same culture, everything, just a different language. Go to Australia, you would still think you're in East Africa or Madagascar. Same people. In Madagascar, there are also people with uh, black skin, with sandy blonde red hair. Just like that. But look where, look where Australia is and look where Madagascar. They're on the same parallel. Same meridian. Y'all understand what's going on? There's a science here that our ancestors laid down. So not only did they plot the stars, they plotted the earth 
The grids ran right through where the pyramids are. Sacred grids. There are three major points we call mountains of the moon. Kilimanjaro means mountain of the moon in Kiswahili. Mount Wanzuri is mountain of the moon in one of the languages in Uganda. And Mount Choka, mountain of the moon in Ethiopia. All of them feed into the Nile, which was in ancient time was called Hapi. Not happy, I know you happy for the information, but it was happy, okay? So, a, a twisted rope, flat, which also symbolizes your DNA. I'm gonna really get into this Madhu Netcha, if y'all give me a minute, because this is your classical language. Take it Think about it, the Madhu Netcha was ancient before the first Greek got to Greece. So you know Greek can't be your classical language. So you have to be really clear. We are the original inhabitants of the area they call Greece. That used to be all water and, and canals, and we drained the land and started civilization as a colony there. And the Wazungu coming out of the rainforest got tired of eating each other, and they began to migrate around us. And then they became the first ones with Macedonia and then into Egypt. I mean, excuse me, into the land we call Greek today. Okay. Um, so this is the word hoppy. The twisted flax said it's your DNA. So our lifespan is connected to the Hopi River. There is the hand. This is a receiving information, receiving knowledge, receiving life. There is the mat in which everything rests. If you know in Africa, you, you sleep on the mat, you eat on the mat, you rest on the mat, you have confidence on the mat. And when it gets deep, you roll up your mat and take it with you. <laughs> this is a canal. The canal, myrrh. And even the same word for love is myrrh. But this canal, you, if you don't have no water, you ain't got no love. Look where there's no water. There's no love. Okay. And so they built canals to go out in to make sure that the love was every place they were. And then you see the three waves of energy, which is also the word for water, mu. And then happy, uh, there's a little hermaphrodite uh, uh, at the end. It's a man, beard, he has a breast, he's pregnant. He has a phallus, he got it all. <laughs> what is trying to show you that it can give life by itself, just very nature, harnesses life. Okay, so Hopi, this is our lifeline. It goes from Central Africa, it's over 4,160 miles long, the longest river in the world. That's not an accident. So we have to understand this lifeline. It's a cultural highway. Not only did the information come from in, inside of Africa, traveling down the Hopi River, the culture flowed that way, the language flowed that way, and trade. So it became a cultural highway, a com economic commercial highway, and all of that. And trade took place in Africa, all the way to South Africa, in for tens, for literally hundreds of thousands of years before we left the continent. But when we left the continent, brothers and sisters, we were intact already. We set up the first dynasty in China, the Shang dynasty, actually the first two dynasties mm -hmm. in China. We taught them the language of reading. That's why their writing is down like ours, goes from right to left and top down, just like ours. But like Brother Kabul talked about, they got words in there that's not indicative to their culture. And so somebody came in and helped them set this up, took their language and stuff. They, Every word that re makes reference to astrology, astronomy, or the sky is an African word. Come on. You need to be clear about that. Very okay, clear. I, I'm what, a lot of places all along here are imitations of actually what's going on here that's left in this world. Because you have to understand, at the last flood, all of this area went under. Africa is a plateau, the whole continent. The whole continent is a plateau. And so when Europe was totally submerged with water, well, ice first and then water, Africa was still a valuable place. This is why they don't want you to know geography. But how many people saw the movie 2012? When the water finally receded and the rest of the world was destroyed, where were they at? Africa. Africa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this information is there. Uh, a lot of people, my more brothers, I'm a more, a lot of people, you know, no, civilization was here in North America first. No, I need to tell you, during the Ice Age, North America all the way to, to Florida was under ice. 
where there was a flourishing civilization here, this was under ice. People don't know geography. Some of the brothers was like, no, when the continents move, you know, we move with it. Like they were surfing the continents as they was moving. No. When the continents moved, <laughs> there was no people here. All right, so I need to be real clear about that. They talk about, what, 65 million years ago was the last disaster. They got footprints and stuff like that of human beings older than that. But we won't go that deep yet. Don't want to go that deep. Right. Now, now that we got our spatial perspective correct, you're not getting orientated here. You got your proper spatial perspective together. And you'll understand. In the Hopi River, we buried our dead on the western bank of the Nile where the sun sets. Okay? The sun rose on the east and sets in the west. We face most of our temples orientated like this or south in the direction of our ancestors. Okay? Not north. So you need to be very, very clear about this. So now that we got our spatial perspective right, we have a little direction of what's going on in the interior. I want to talk about some of these places. Ancient Kemet could not come into existence without places like this first. This is called, let me erase some of this so that you can see what's going on. Take your time. This first one is called Ta Seti. Ta Seti is one of the ancient names of Kush or Kash or what you call Sudan in present day. It means the land of the bow. We were the greatest archers in the world. How many people saw the movie Hero? Right, with Jet Li and all of right? Yeah. Remember the archers and the bow? They took that from ancient Kush. The Chinese do us in that deep with the arrow until we introduced it to them. So that was a scene coming out of ancient Kush where your arrow, when we attacked our opponent, and there were so many archers that the sky turned black. Okay, so I need you to clearly understand. Ta Seti, another name for ancient Kush. We also call that area Kosh. I know today we use Kush. That's just a European veneration. If you learn them to do Netcha, it's Kosh. And that's why you'll see Kashite, Kashata, uh, Kushata. You know, all those are venerations of Kosh. So Kush is a modern rendition of the ancient name Kosh. Okay. When you see mountains at the end, it just meant that this was a foreign land outside of ancient Kemet. So when ancient, because I'm writing it the way the ancient Quebec de Oum wrote the name of these countries. When they wrote their name, they probably wouldn't have had foreign mountains there. Okay? But if you understand the Hopi Valley, everything outside of Kemet, you got to go to the mountains. And so that's why when they talk about foreign countries, this is a determinative that means this is outside of the borders of Kemet. So, Ta Seti Kosh. Also, they call it Ta Nehesi. Ta Nehesi, the land of the Hesi bird, the guinea fowl. Okay? Um, where the Nechanit is, who is the archer. Okay, and I'm going to go into some of the Nechanit in a minute. This is the, one of the most affectionate names of Kemet, and it's written like this. Kemet, the black community. This is the determinative for community, city, or town. Not the black land, like the European Egypt. See, the European Egyptologists didn't even want you to know it meant black anything. But then we start reading them and do Nechanit, and they would say, oh, okay, South Africa, maybe South Box. Okay, all right, y'all got the black part down. But it's black land. Because the Nile overflow will leave everything black. So I had never went to Egypt at the time. So I said, okay, that, that sounds pretty good. Fertile land, black land. But then I, I start doing my reading, and the people were called the Kemetic U, the black people. I said, did the Nile overflow on them too? <laughs> no, this black means something else. This is talking about melanin. All right. All right. Dr. Ben liked to use this. This is one of their most affectionate names. Ta Mary. It means the beloved land. That's the affection they had for the land, the beloved land. And it was righteous all year round. This is the symbol for year. And so their community was beloved all year round. Ooh. And they got a snake by that name. Okay, all right. Man. And this is called, this is the third name of ancient Kemet. So Kemet had three major names now. The other one is Sima Tawi, the united two lands. This is the heart with the trachealer vein, so the oxygen can get in there, because if there's no oxygen going to the heart, that's all, folks. All right? So that's unity. Shows unity here. So Sima Tawi, the united two lands. So that's what ancient Kemet. This is the mother, the parents of ancient Kemet. And now this is Kemet. 
So this is why it's so important for you. This land, this is three dots there represent the, uh, the uh, mineral carbon. This land, when the ancient Kemet U talk about eternity, they do something like this. Watch this. That's one of the ways they write eternity, right? As long as energy exists within your DNA and the light of Ra shines, you shall exist. Mm -hmm. This is why they don't want you to know your language. I'm going to break it down. Okay. They also make forever and eternity like this. The cobra symbolizing, symbolizing your spine of your kundalini. As long as there's energy in your mind, you should be able to nourish yourself on the land. As long as the land exists, you will have nourishment, you will have energy, then you shall exist. You see how important this language is. So it speaks to us. It talks about who we are and how we are to flourish off of Ra and the land. Okay, so we need to stand. There's three major domains on this planet. Each planet different and within the solar system. You have the mineral domain, which is based upon carbon, which is black. You have the plant, the plant domain, which is based on chlorophyll, which is green. And then you have the animal domain, which is based on melanin, which is black. So only black and green are sources of light. That's why Asar, we, we picked it green and called the great black. Chlorophyll is to plants as melanin is to human beings, as carbon is to the land. Right? So hopefully that will resonate on you. Ideal resonation. Okay. So again, this importance of jumping into the Madhu Netra. And you notice when we wrote the family, the black family, we have the child, the woman, and the man. Not two brothers, or not two sisters up there. Okay. That's representing eternity. Okay, all right, so we're jumping in here. All right, so is everybody comfortable with what I got up there? You understand what's going on? You understand why it's so important for us to understand the Madhu Detra? Now, ancient Kemet, most of us are mesmerized by the, the pictures, the gold, the jewelry, and all those things. But what's really so dynamic about Kemet is the mathematics. It's their ability to understand so above, so below. Even a town, these districts in ancient Kemet, were written like, uh, okay, everybody got this down. You, have, okay. you understand that you've been on your head your whole life? You can move the board. <laughs> okay, uh, I can move the board? Yeah, oh, okay. There you go. All right, they're moving to the modern era. Okay, all right. Um, I wanted people to know that, for example, This word, pet, means heaven. Heaven. This is like the skyline of the earth. And the creator rests and is known through the cosmos. Heaven. Sky. The districts in ancient Kemet, there were 42, were called Sapet. Pet. And this is Sapet. Or if in the plural, Sapetu or Sapet. This means to cause to be like that. Mm. So every district was trying to imitate a cosmological phenomena that existed in the sky. Which means that you already, before you had Kemet, before you broke the 42 districts down, you already had to plot the sky. You already understood the zoomorphic energy in the sky representing certain energies. So, in ancient Kemet, every sepet, the cause like, had to have a zoomorphic image in the sky. Like your school had to have a mascot. Every state has to have a flag. So, every sepet had a flag, had a zoomorphic energy, 
It had a bird, a stone, a crystal, a oil. And so today, each state in the United States, because you had 53 of the 56 people who signed a Declaration of Independence were all Freemasons, they were studying this. So every state got a flag, they got a flower, got a bird. They, they didn't get that from Europe. That's all Africa. Right? So I need you to clearly understand that, where that phenomena comes from. We took this really serious. Like we plotted the heavens, and we took that information and duplicated it on Earth. All right? So, Madhu Neche. Why is this so divine? Why is it you got classical angle? It's divine words of the creator. Madhu represents words. But what kind of words? This is a walking stick of an elder. So it's just not any words. It's wise words of an elder. A wise word of an elder who's connected to divinity. And so that was the spoken language and the written language. Um, I'm going to pass this around. This is so-called how they were supposed to um, break the code of how to read the Badu Neche. This is called the Rosetta Stone. This is a duplicate of the Rosetta Stone. I know we talked about it, but uh, like Brother Kaba, I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm a touchy-feely guy. You know, I want you to touch it, feel it. <laughs> Just don't sit on it. Okay, pass that here. <laughs> pass that around. So you can see the three different types of languages that they help. What they didn't tell you is that Rosetta, that Chapelion, best friend, had taught him Coptic. And Coptic is the last version of the Madhu Neche. They didn't tell you that. My sister had a question over there. What? Well, it's divine words, but I was letting you know that the words represent words of an elder. So it's divine words of our elders expressed through the Creator. Mostly, we're going to have a question and answer period, you know, so uh, here we go. So, Netcha. Now, some of our brothers who don't speak the language are regurgitating what the Europeans say, so they break this down and they just use NTR. And they say Netcha. But I want you to know, in the old period, the first golden age, and in the second golden age, they used the word nature, and they spelt it like this. So that's why we have to know the glyphs. This word is T-C-H. So this is N, T-C-H, R, the nature. It's where the word nature comes from. If you put your vowels in, you get the word nature. What does nature mean to you? Huh? Come on, give me some definitions of nature. Life. Air. Life. Wind. Air. Fire. Energy. Energy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we look at the creator. It was divine, a divine nature. That's everything. Don't substitute this word for God. All of the Egyptologists and even our own African scholars just substitute nature for God. God is a Gothic word and it doesn't mean this. Because when I say the nature, I'm talking about the heartbeat, the beat in between the heart. That which cannot be seen, that which is still coming into being. My shoes. <laughs> yeah, the nature is all that exists. There's nothing outside of the nature. I don't think when you're in church, I don't think they kind of say God is like that. You know, God ain't no bug. You know, they're not thinking that. But you know, no, we're thinking that, oh no, that but God is expressed in that thing. And therefore, I don't need to be smashing it. Just pick it up and put it outside. It was probably there before you were. Okay, all right. Nature, everything is divine. And so therefore, we look at nature differently. Everybody who came to ancient Kush or Kemet in Africa said, these are the most divine spiritual people we have ever seen. In fact, they are fanatical about it. We were only fanatical about it because they were absent of it. What's being fanatical about giving homage and life to all living beings? How many of y'all in your biology class or something had organic and inorganic? Mm -hmm. Some things had life and some things didn't. That don't even make no sense. Everything has life. Energy cannot be destroyed, only transformed from one state to another. Only the creator creates. All we do is reorganize the nature's creation. Mm, break it down. Y'all understand that? Yes. Don't let them bamboozle you there. 
you know, in a class called chemistry. Chem, the black science. How many people understood that when they got in their chemistry class that you were studying the black science? Nobody. Okay, that means you've been bamboozled. Okay. All right. So, are we clear on this word, this language, madu netcha, what it means, and why we need to understand the language? Because it went from there to netcha. See, the Egyptologists will put a, a line under the T, and that means that's TCH, right? Tetch. But after a while, the line just vanished, and people just said netcha, and now people, and then people add S on here talking about the netters. I don't know what they're talking about. Okay? When you want to make it plural, it becomes the netcheru. Now, I need to stay there because here we go. The gods and goddesses of Egypt. No way do you work. No, brothers and sisters. No gods and goddesses of Egypt. The divine principles and laws of ancient Egypt. Each one of y'all, see, once you know, you got a responsibility. Before y'all were ignorant. Everybody take a sniff. Go in. Oh. Once you know, you have a responsibility. <laughs> Somebody can't get the sniff. They, 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 they're missing the oil. Okay. Well, right. missing the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> okay, the Rosetta Stone. So let me just take a minute now and go through the natural rules since we are right there. The divine principles and laws. And people, everybody in this room, I don't care if you're a Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, you haven't figured it out yet. The divine principles and laws don't care. Everybody in here is familiar with gravity? Do you think gravity cares if you like it or not? Do you think gravity cares who you are, whether it's going to respond to you? No, gravity gets us all. It's a principle. It's a law. It's set up by the divine creator. And it acts on all of us unless you become creator-like. And only when you become creator-like can you mind melt with that energy and alter its state. That's what alchemy and stuff is all about. Transferring the energy and the vibration because everything in the universe is energy. So that means the only way you can defy a law or a principle is you become the law or principle and you redefine it within your own paradigm. Some of y'all will get that in the morning. Okay, now. Haru in Maketi. How many of y'all want to call this something else? Come on, level with me. You want to call it the what? The Sphinx, y'all. Yeah? Come on out with it. The Sphinx, a mythological creature that comes from Europe that has wings that will kill you if you don't know the riddle. Has nothing to do with Haru in Maketi. To master your animal domain, which is like the lion, to rise to your highest spiritual nature, which is the high priest. So now, if your son says, I want to be a Sphinx, or if he says, I want to be Haru in Maketi, which one would you send to? <laughs> right. He says, Dad or Mom, I want to protect our family and our culture from sunrise to sunset. And I want to be like a root, the champion of the people. You see, that's why we can't let other people define our stuff. Haru Im Aketi. Let me hear y'all say it. Haru Im Aketi. All right. I can feel the vibration go up. All right. Washington, D.C., how many people have been there? You've seen the Washington Monument? Some of y'all think they came from Washington. No? This is imitation. This is the Tekken. How many people saw our video of the Tekken? All right, I'd like to see that uh, after all this. Yeah, give yourself something. Support yourself. Okay. The Tekken is of our spiritual energy representing the masculine phallic symbol which has to interconnect with the female symbol in order to create life. But it's symbolic of our resurrection, our rebirth, our renewal. There were usually two of these set on both sides of all the temples in Kemet to represent the father and the son, Asar and Aset. The ruling king was Haru. When he died, he became Asar, to resurrect, to be reborn, to live over and over and over again. And we bear witness because we are their children. And we, they live through us. Let me make this statement, y'all. You are the ancestor. The ancestor is not somebody you just pour like. <laughs> because I, I embody the natural root. I embody their energy. That's what you got to do when you're fighting this enemy here. See, let me tell you this. Remember I said we were covering addicts of white male domination? If you're thinking like they're thinking, just with a little Afrocentric flavor, 
That's what we do. We're coming. We still only got two people. But still, them. Put a little African flavor. <laughs> just put a little African flavor in there. You know, you, know, you put a little vanilla, you know. A little tr- no, you just put a little African and some, and some European Caucasian flavor. So they know what you're going to do before you do it. Because <clears throat> you're trying to imitate them to get free. When you speak their name, Marcus, when you speak their names, they resonate within you. Okay? That gives you your energy, your responsibility. When you say Harriet Tubman, you're leading the Underground Railroad. Even if it's just your neighborhood, help somebody. What? Harriet said she could have helped hundreds of thousands more if we only knew we were slaves. If you only knew you was upside down, you'd be able to get yourself straight. So it's your job to help to be like Harriet Tubman. So when you mention these names, so that's the first way you speak their name. Number two, you deify their complete work. These are their complete works. They laid down the principles, the laws of the universe. They charted the stars. They set up the zodiac, the zoomorphic energy of the sky that exists within us. The combination of all the animals in the world exists within you. You ever seen a fetus going through its various stages? It goes through the, uh, the, what, amphib- uh, the water stage, the amphibian stage, to the mammal stage. You are a combination of all the animals that exist on Earth. They exist within you, but you're taking it to a higher conscious because you can act like the creator. You can take the thought and create it to anything you want. So we are nature-like. So when I open up and say we are divine spiritual beings, having a divine human experience, look at yourself as a divine being. How many people have seen this? You bump into something and go, oh, I'm so clumsy. You know, no. That's called negative self-talk. That permeates in your water. Your body is 75% water. Water holds more memory than any molecule on the planet Earth. So when you speak to your water, your water reflects that energy back. So that's why positive affirmation is so powerful because when you speak to yourself, that resonates in your water and your water says, yeah, yeah. So you don't get in the mirror talking about, oh, it's a bad hair day. I can't get it together. No. Then you think your hair bad? It's really going to get funky. Okay? No. (laughs) Speak what you want. Don't talk about how broke you are. Talk about how your funds is getting ready to come in. They're a little low now. You got that disease called my funds is low. Okay, but you, but you, you're getting ready. To, it's coming. You can slow it. Can you feel it, brother? It's coming in. All right, all right. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's coming. Speak what you want. That's why in all the sacred books it says, "In the beginning was the what? Word. And the word was what? With God. With God. And the word was God. Where do you think they got that from? Amen. 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 Okay. All right. Come on, come on. Let me go here. Sabek. They don't usually tell you about this. Come on and break them down. Sabek is the comedic word for time. The Sabek has 60 teeth, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 vertebrae going down his back, 60 minutes in an hour. <laughs> this goes on. Sabek is amphibious, but yet it's mammal. It lays eggs like a bird, but yet it's a mammal. It has to lay its eggs outside of the water. And so when the Nile was getting ready to overflow, Sabek knew just how high the Nile would flow, plant his eggs at that level, and the people knew where to start moving their things to. Because that's how in tune Sebek was with the flow of the Nile and, and the energy that exists within the universe. We have that ability, we just kind of lost ours. Okay? But Sebek, symbolic of time. Sebek is another energy of, of Setesh. Okay? Sebek, the crocodile, will only bother you if you are confused and don't know what you're doing. <laughs> when the Nile, when the Hopi River was low, Hopi, the Sebek would come on land looking for some food. Now, if the Hopi River is low, you know you ain't supposed to be hanging down there, taking a nap on the beach. <laughs> then you was going to be a snack, okay? <laughs> and then you want to be mad at Sebek. He's doing what he was doing. You were not doing what you were supposed to be doing. Controller of time. You can't control time. Control your energy within time because time is only a concept of consciousness. Our ancestors were able to travel through time because they bent it based upon their consciousness. So you didn't take you a thousand years to go to another planet. You can get here like that. They talk about we come from Tibet. 
uh, Spadette, if you were on a spaceship like we have today, it would be a thousand years to get there. They got there like that. It was a bit of time because time is only relevant to your level of consciousness. This brother, this happens to be Usur Ma'at Ra, Setepin Ra, the person they call Ramses II. He's wearing a caprice crown, the blue crown. If you see little curls, little knots up on top of here, it represents a hairstyle. In my book, I showed about it. The Watusi, the Zulu, all of them wore this hairstyle during the second golden age when it came to an end and we got invaded by the Hyksos and Asiatic foreigners who ruled Kemet for maybe 100 plus years. When they were kicked out, the brothers from the south, up south, where's my map? No, no, oh, I sure did. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I got a backup. <laughs> the brothers from the, you see, we have to manufacture our own stuff. That just goes in here. I don't depend upon the Wazugo information. We got our own stuff because we are the creators of all this stuff. We have to go back and producing our own books, producing our own tapes, producing our own works, producing our own houses. Most of our houses are backwards and set up for Wazungu. We need to change it. Why do you want the energy from Khan Ed when you got Ra, the sun? Mm. Mm. Let me say that again. Why do you plug into Khan Ed when you got Ra, the sun? You see how we're depending upon our former enslavers? We need to come together. And we need to make it happen. Ra's still waiting on us. <coughs> All right, man. So, our brothers who came from up south wore this hairstyle as they kicked the enemy, the Hyksos, butt all the way back into Asia. The ancient Kemeta Ud was so, uh, so thankful and so appreciative of this that they developed a crown, a war crown, it's called the war crown, that whenever they went into battle, and it didn't have to be physical battle, it could be a spiritual battle. Whenever they were having large meetings to organize the community, then the suit put this crown on. So this is from the third golden age on. That's the so-called 18th dynasty. So from that dynasty on is the only time you see this crown. So if you see somebody with this crown, they try to say that was the old period or the first period. Eh, wrong, okay? You know your story. Third golden age on, 18th dynasty on, okay? I set. I have to put a set with a saw. We have saw the great black. I set. Let me write her name down so that y'all see this connection between the two. This is the right angle that the Masons and everybody get all excited about. Okay. Um, you stand on your square, brother. You know, okay. But in here, they would, <laughs> there would be a, the Sematawi, and they would have the a lotus plant and the papyrus plant tied with a knot showing the unification of upper and lower Kemet. Okay? And it's on the square. This is the throne. This is how you write Aset's name. Aset. She is the throne maker. No ruler in Kemet can sit on the throne until they come through her, through the woman. And so, brothers, when you think you're ruling the house, you rule through your woman. Okay? She is the throne. When they want to write Asar's name, you got the throne there, right? But, His name, Wasar or Asar, is like that because he is the I behind the throne. Er also is an action verb that means to make, to do, to bring things, to make things happen. And so he takes the energy from the feminine energy and makes it happen. He is the I that protects the throne. That's why he has the cobra and the uraeus on top of his head. That represents upper and lower Kemet, the two ladies. The two women, that's called Nepti. So you have Nepti. You have uh, on this side, you have the vulture. And on this side, you have the coat. Wajet and Nekabet. All right? And so when the king has these two symbols on his crown, that represents that he is a protector of the two energies. And you'll see this 
on all of the masseuse. Usually the woman only has the cobra on her head, but everybody has seen this. You've seen the bust uh, on my table. I got a bust of, uh, I guess you see the cobra. That represents the Nebji. The two ladies, women, in ancient Kemet, they constantly showed you just how important you are, how powerful you were, that we exist through you. Our very nature is to protect you and to keep you because you are a divine essence of all life on this planet. So brothers, can y'all give these sisters a hand? Right now. Show them an appreciation for them. Stand up and get them a standing ovation. Stand up, brothers. why we do what we do. We ain't doing this for the other brother, like Alexander and his Greek army. <laughs> now you know, Alexander was gay, even though know, he was undefeated in battle. He would always put, he would divide the lovers up and have them fight from both sides. And so the lovers, and they would put the enemy in between. So the lovers was fighting to get through the enemy to get to their lover on the other side. So they were tenacious warriors. <laughs> Okay, all right, so we're not going there. <laughs> so, you understand this feminine nature. So, Asar became the I, the maker, the doer, Aset. She is the feminine energy, the mut, the womb. On top of her head, she has the cow, because she was also depicted as the great cow, like in Het Haru, that's what's up here. Het Haru, Aset, Neverhead, sometimes they would be all intertwined, because they represent the mut the mother energy. And the mother energy would be depicted by the vulture. Now I know I was teaching them to do nature class, and his sister said, oh, so y'all the great falcon, and we got to be a buzzer. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, sister, no, you went real left, you were real European on me. <laughs> you got to alter your state of consciousness. See, you only came like that because you was upside down. What you should have asked me was, well, what does this buzzer just represent? And you'll realize, that it's one of the greatest nurturing mothers on the universe. Right. It will eat off its own leg, chew it up, and feed it to its children when there's no food. That's right. it, it, the, the female vulture doesn't need a male to get pregnant. It faces the eastern wind, and the wind impregnates. Shoo. We call it shoo. The cosmic, the cosmic winds of the universe. Not only that, she has such a powerful stomach acid she can devour a, a caucus that has maggots and everything on it that would make any other animal sick. She can digest it and then regurgitate it and feed it to her young and it would be nurturing food. So what she did, she took all the caucuses and all the things that would cause disease and cleaned it up. And so, come on, brothers and sisters, you know, like, when stuff get real funky, you call the woman up in there. You know, you got the little baby until something happened, then go back to mommy. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. And she's the one that cleans up the filth, you know, and everything, you know. Uh, you throw up, you know, like, oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> all right. So mut, that's that mothering energy. And we can go on and on and on. So that's why you have to know these things in nature. Because I'm sure, just raise your hand if you had a negative idea of the vulture. Raise your hand. Look at that. That's because you are upside down, on your head, taking your information from your enemy. And you're starting to see why we need to change our paradigm. 2012 is here. You're going to die with your enemy unless you change. You understand where we're coming from? Brother Kaba made it real clear that the Japanese had a chance to change at the end of World War II. They were the leading industry of solar energy, but they chose nuclear energy instead. They wanted to follow the Europeans. They want to out-European the Europeans. And now they've almost dug their own grave. Okay, y'all? All right, y'all see what I'm talking about. The Chinese people are only able to get themselves together when they chased their enemy out and had a cultural revolution. When they opened up them doors, they knew who they were. Say it again, I don't get that. <laughs> a cultural revolution. Malcolm made it clear. Made it real clear. Okay? He showed a picture of a a, a 10 year old girl blowing her father's brains out because he was an Uncle Tom Chinaman. When that girl grew up to be a full grown woman, there were almost no more Toms in China. Think about it in America. Toms is on the, the cover of Life magazine. Com, 
Times is on the cover of that comic book, Ebony and Jet. Times, <laughs> Times is old. Times is everywhere. You actually look up the Times. Son, I want you to go off and be like that time. I mean, uh, Dr. So-and-so, okay? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Times get Nobel Peace Prizes when there's no peace. <laughs> now, if the wolf gives the sheep a peace prize, and the wolf is fat and the sheep is skinny, there's a problem there. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't see it. And we like, yes, yeah, son. Yeah, daughter, you grow up and you might get one of those too. No, you don't want one of those. <laughs> okay, all right, let's jump back in here. Right. <laughs> the first family, the first trinity, Hassar, Arset, and Haru. I hope I don't, I know we got some Jesus folks up in here. They're sneaking everywhere. <laughs> oh, I got some, some born-again Kometa-U people in here. You know, like Ray Higgins. He was, the first time he heard the word Haru in a meeting, he wanted to fight. No, oh, Jesus ain't got nothing to do with no Haru. You know, he wanted to beat them. He's supposed to be a Christian minister. He's ready to fight, beat somebody up, because they confused Jesus with Haru. But just give him the tape. Look at this. Read this book, 18 Crucified Saviors Before J.C. And they all did exactly the same thing that J.C. did prior to him. So J.C. just had a, he had a map, right? If you want to, that energy, somebody followed that energy that was already laid out, and all he did was do everything everybody else did. Okay. You had the father, the son, and Haru. The son is Haru. The word hero comes from the word Haru, because Haru is just H-R-U. If I put an E there, and the O and the O sound the same, the word hero, which means champion of the people. Peru fights against Isfet. Right. Peru is your consciousness. A lot of the, the Nasupiti, the rulers, would have the falcon on the back of their head because they represent higher consciousness. Higher consciousness. Okay? And so that means that you got to be in battle every day. I love this example of ancient Kemi. It's not like you can mess up all week and go to church on Sunday and it's okay. Or do Sabbath on Saturday. And, and you'd be forgiven for your sin. Or just confess to Father. Father, I raped a whole lot of people and did some messed up stuff this week, but I know you're going to forgive me. No. Haru says, oh, you have to be a champion every day. How would you feel, let's say it's 90 degrees today, that means Rob was really, really cooking, right? Rob was out there, y'all was just, you know, oh, yeah. And then Ross said, well, look, I was so good today, I think I'm just not going to come out for a couple days. What would happen? Yeah. If Ra act like Negroes, <laughs> 2012 would have been here yesterday. <laughs> okay, all right? So Ra is consistent every single day. The universe is consistent every single day. The cosmos is consistent every single day. Energy is flowing every second of every single day. Negroes take breaks every single day. <laughs> People, you got to kill the Negro inside of you. You got to resurrect. You got to be reborn. You got to be Haru. I want to hear some born again Haru energy up in here. Okay? <laughs> That's what you need. Every day, and I don't care how bad you were yesterday. I don't care if you gave a smoking lecture, you did a whole bunch of stuff, and so today you're just gonna get high and hang out. No! <laughs> you gotta come back today and you gotta be on it also. You know? So you will never see him from DC at Smitty's Bar having barbecue and hanging out with the boys, talking stuff. Because <laughs> then it will contradict everything that we're about. Do y'all understand? You gotta be Haru all the time. You gotta be a champion of the people. If you tell your children, just do what I say, not what I do, what's gonna happen? We already know what's gonna happen. What's happening now? Pass down. Right, okay, all right. All right, so Haru is the champion of the people. He's the champion because he does battle with Isfet. Isfet is that energy that wants to pull you out of balance, wants to pull you out of harmony. You say, okay, bean sprouts, chocolate chip. You had bean sprouts yesterday. <laughs> Set, right? That, you lost. Listen, the ancient Kometa U makes it real clear. Everything 
is either life-giving or life-threatening. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. Life-giving or life-threatening. When you get ready to eat, life-giving, life-threatening. You have a mate, life-giving, life-threatening. I'm not talking about how hot she is or how tough or buff she is. Life-giving or life-threatening. You getting ready to go out that evening. Is it a life-giving experience or a life-threatening experience? If you're at Smitty's Bar having barbecue with the boys with a cold one, I think that's a life-threatening situation. Okay. So even if you don't even, if you don't do what everybody around you was doing, you get caught in it. Listen, I was one of the priests that they brought in for the uh, vigilance for the World Trade Center for all those blacks who died in the World Trade Center. But one of the things I made sure as we talked about their souls being resurrected and the death, when you eat with Stormy, you die with Stormy. If you wallow in the mud, you get there. If you're playing in the funk, you got to get funky. Brothers and sisters, you need to get the European mindset out of your consciousness. You need to get them off your back, your clothes. You need to get them out of your diet. You need to get them out of your bed. You need to get them out of your total consciousness so that you can go back to being the creators that you rise waiting on you, ready to give you all the energy you need. All the energy you need. I tell you, I don't have no bad days. Every day is a great, magnificent day. Because you determine how dynamic you're going to be. You determine how much money you want to make. You determine where you want to go. I wanted to go to Kevin. 1981, I went with Dr. Ben. You know, I gave him this thesis, this paper and everything. He said, okay, listen, I'll let you go for half price, but you're going to be my aide. I said, oh, bet. I'm down with that. What you want me to do? Okay. That was 1981. I've been to Kemet over 25 times, and I've never paid again. You will. You don't need no money. You need your mind. Some of you think you never left anything in Africa. No, you left your mind there. You need to reconnect. Reconnect. Reconnect to the whole continent. Reconnect. Yes, we are the indigenous people here, but you need to go where they came from here. You need to keep that going. Um, so Haru, the father, the son, the, the mother, the father, and the son, the holy trinity. And so you can see where the Christian, now let me just say this. Mary, I mean, I said other name is Mary, the beloved one. That's why Jesus' mother had to be Mary. Mary means the beloved one. So she had the same mother that Jesus had because he's the imitation of her. At 30, he went to do, to go, well, at 13, he went to do his father's work. Haru went to go train with his uncle, Haru Ur, in the temples at 13. At 30, he came back to do battle with Seth. Jesus came back to do his, his teaching of him. The 12 disciples are the 12 zodiac. It had nothing to do with no people. The book is a book of astrology and astronomy. How many people look at their horoscope every day or every other day? Come on, raise your hand. It's not a horoscope. Hora is the word for haru. Scope is what you look at, so is haru's vision. You're checking out haru's vision. We created this so that we can see where we were going before we got there. And when you get a, a view from the height, you get a sky view. So you're Haru vision, your horoscope is a vision of your future and where you've been so that you, if it was good, you can get there again. If it wasn't, you know how not to go there. Right. Okay? And it kind of gave you a peek into where you were headed. It was a, what is it called? Uh, what's that system? The PG, uh, the, 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 the car that helped you get there? What is that? GPS. Yeah. GP, what is it? Global positioning. The GPS system. But Haru, your consciousness, you got that inside. Your cell phone is imitating what you were able to do by sending energy out there. Okay, so we got the Holy Trinity now. Let me come over here. Second, the daughter of Ra. The daughter of Ra. Sekhmet. I see a couple of Sekhmet people hiding over there. Okay, all right. <laughs> when things were going wrong and people got confused, Ra sent his daughter down to straighten stuff up. So Sekhmet went down, and Sekhmet's job was only to mess with folks who weren't together. But Sekmo, Sekmet found so many people that weren't together, she started devouring everybody. So the Netcharu 
came up and said, Rob, you got to do something about Sekhmet. She just doing everybody in. She just fell in love with blood. She just drinking blood. She just killing everybody. <laughs> None of the other natural roots said, oh, no, I ain't messing with that sister. And y'all know, brothers, I don't care how bad a brother is. You ain't seen a real fight. You see some sisters. <laughs> Brothers, we just trying to be outdo each other. You know, we trying to get our pain, knock them out. Yeah, you know, I'm like sisters. We trying to kill each other. Ah, ah, pull their hair out. Ah, you can get a hold of us. Ah, kill them. I ain't never seen a brothers fight like that. <laughs> so segment was doing everybody in. So none of the other natural said, no, uh, uh-uh, uh, I ain't touching that. Uh, uh-uh, uh, bro, you got to you send your booty down there. So Jehuti, articulate mind, thought, articulate writing, articulate speech, articulate action. So Jehuti came and obsessed the situation. He said, oh, okay. She just fell in love with blood. So I'm just going to use some black magic on her. Jehuti turned the Nile Hopi River red. Oh, Sekhmet, you don't have to kill nobody else. Just go to the Nile and have a drink. <laughs> Sekhmet saw all the blood. Oh, wow, just dove in. The... But it was wine. <laughs> she got all drunk. <laughs> and when she got almost ready to pass out, Haru, I mean, Jehuti, just put a spell on her and said, when you awaken, you will be Vasek. You will no longer be a ferocious lioness. You will be a gentle, beautiful, purring black cat. And you will adorn people. And you will dance and make music. And you will just be love. And so today, sisters, if you get a little sectation, segmented, get some red wine. Call it a day. (laughs) Put on some black. And just get sexy for your man. Okay, uh, and Jehuti, again, represent articulate thought. Jehuti is not some god outside. Remember, Jehuti exists inside of your mind. Everybody has Jehuti in there. When you're using reasoning, when you're using consciousness, that's your Jehuti thought. Don't give up. Your, the word thought comes from thought. Jehuti, to think. Some of us are not doing that. Okay, so when you're thinking, that's, you're doing your Jehuti. Jehuti is the tongue of Ptah. The creative spark of the universe. The creative energy. The architect of the universe. The engineer of life. Jehuti is his tongue. Ra, the creative energy that exists and permeates all things on this planet. Jehuti is his voice. Aman, the unseen energy that permeates every cell and every entity of life throughout the cosmos is the mind. Jehuti is his mind. So Jehuti, that means that all that is exists within you. And that's why to educate really means to bring out. The Western world, they stuff and stuff in that you memorize and protect. No, it's to bring out. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. The reason why you're going like, yeah, is because you, you are resonating on that. That was inside of you. And all I did was bring it to the surface. That's Jehuti. And so he is in there. So y'all got to use your Jehuti. Don't be afraid to put these on your altar and in your house. You ain't bringing some gods and stuff in there. You're bringing divine principles that's going to help you on your mission. And each of these principles can resonate with a Haru vision. They can resonate on your organs that plays the music for your temple. They can resonate on you getting your program together. Maybe you need a little segment in your life. Maybe you need, maybe you've been procrastinating, so you need your hootie on your altar, looking at you in your face every day, so you can do what you're supposed to be doing. Okay. And, and if they don't get it, you get it for them and put the jihuti out there. <laughs> Unpool. A lot of us wear black at funerals. No, you should probably be able to be in white to reflect, to come back so that you can get the energy. Now, European saw that Enpu, Anpu, was black, and, and all his priests wore the black that they were preparing the body. So, because they didn't bury their dead. You understand that, right? 
the ancient Asiatics and the, and the ancient Europeans didn't bury your dead. When you're in the cave, ain't no place to bury them. When, when Uncle Raheem died, you just put him over on the side. You ate him. When you run out of bowls, you just get his head and kind of wash it out. And you drink it out of his skull. Oh, yeah. Right, you know, okay. And that's why they got all these horror pictures, the night of the living dead and all that. Because they were living with the dead people. They were in the cave with them. Look, if you're rocking an ice glacier that's a mile high, and you can't get out, only certain people can. That means that some people never saw the sun in their whole lifetime. So you're in a cave, you never saw the sun. Uncle Raheem died, you just put him over on the side. You break a mortar set up, he's standing up. Ooh, come out of here, okay? So that's in your subconscious. That's in your subconscious mind. So you got people walking around, you know, half eaten up. You know, come on, Frankenstein, all that. That comes out of the European mind. We created theater, y'all, and we didn't have no horror. That's from the Greek ethic. They created horror. They got the, the fan face and, the, and, the, and the, the sad one and the happy face, you know. No, we just had some happy faces. You know, we had some mystery and stuff like that, but, you know, we were trying to make it real, but the horror stuff, no, we didn't. No, that, that wasn't our cup of tea. Okay? All right? So I need you to understand that. So Anpu was just preparer of the body for the next journey. He has a whole bunch of different names, you know? The one who was the head of the mountain, the one who was leader of the way, the guardian, the transformer, <coughs> you know, all those different names. Each of the Netrahu has many different nicknames. And in my book, Spiritual Warriors Are Healing, I break down all the Netrahu, I give you the various different names and their energy, you know? And, and I break down little concepts, like for example, when we say that every living king was Shimsu Haru. Now you say, come on, bro. The king is a bird. <laughs> a pigeon. What's up with that? Uh, there's a person who doesn't understand nature. I said, no, man. The hawk, the hawk, the falcon, and the eagle, they're in the same family. They fly higher than any bird. They got an extra layer of skin that goes over their eye, and they can see directly in the sun. No other creature can do that. They have no rivalry in the sky. Their vision is so keen, they can spot a mouse under a leaf from a mile, hovering a mile in the sky, and they're 99% accurate. Air pilots are imitating falcons. They can calculate the speed and the bend of light as they, a fish is going this way. He's going this way, 70 miles an hour. Dives down, turns in under the water, and comes up 98 times, 99% of the time with the fish. People, they're still trying to calculate that. And so now, if you understand this, this power that the falcon, the eagle has, he has no rivalry in the sky. He perches and has his nest on the highest mountain or the highest tree. Now, so if you understand that because you live in the country and you understand that, and a brother came up to you and said, I'm a mighty falcon. you be like, yeah, you got it. <laughs> Especially if you've been acting like a chicken. <laughs> and chicken for breakfast, you know, yeah, you got this. You know, you ain't trying to get away because you ain't no place to go. Ain't no place to hide. Mm. So that's the way the rulers in ancient Kemet, they were Shimsu Haru. They were mighty falcons. So you have to understand nature. But watch this, and I, I teach that everything in nature has at least three levels. You see, this is where the magic is. Watch this. Come on, magical chemist. This is Kepper. Now, I know I'm teaching this in class. This is, oh, you know, you're going to study bugs now. <laughs> no, sister, rise up, rise up. Alternate, you upside down, turn around. Kepper, a dung beetle. So we understand. The first level is the concrete, the physical. What it is? What does the dung beetle do? The dung beetle recycles the filth. In the Serengeti plains in Tanzania, hundreds of uh, elephants, giraffes, zebras, water buffalo, all out grazing. So if you're grazing, if something goes in, it has to what? Come out. So you know it has the potentiality to get very funky. Y'all bear with it. Can I get an amen on that? Amen, amen for the funk. Okay. Now, Kepra cleans up all of the funk. An elephant turd is like this big. Mm -hmm. When it comes down, within two hours, you can't find it. Thousands 
hundreds of thousands of these dung beetles, birds on it. They dig a hole in the ground. That's called irrigation. Then they roll the dung into a perfect sphere. No other creature on the planet can do that. They lay their eggs inside of it and then bury the inside of the ground. So when they put the dung in the ground, that's called what? Fertilization. Irrigation, fertilization. So you see what a Serengeti, the largest grassland in the world is the Serengeti Plains in Tanzania. There are more animals there per square mile than any place else on the planet Earth, the home of cattle. In the south. Oh, sir. Y'all understand? Y'all with me? Take another sniff, y'all. All right, we're going in. <laughs> okay, that's the physical level. That's the physical level. So, we understand that it recycles. It takes filth and cleans it up. In the morning, when you step out in the Tanzania plain and take fresh air, no dung. Right now, they got to they gotta import dung beetles to Texas because all the cows is pooping all over every place. The underground water is all polluted and, and, and it's messing up the whole water shift, the whole water shed and everything like that because they messed up the ecology because they don't know nothing about nature. They killed all of the natural pesticides and in insects with their uh, uh, pesticides and fertilizers. Okay, so now we have a concrete level. Number two is what does it do? It recycles, it comes into being in every day. Because if they took a day off of not collecting the poop, y'all understand what would happen, right? Thousand zebra, thousand wildebeest, thousand and some elephants. All you need is a day off. <laughs> <laughs> y'all got the picture? Everybody got, you got the picture. See, the visualization is happening here. You got the picture. So he's coming into being and he's coming forth every day. You all remember what it was like in New York when the garbage people took uh, one on, on strike, right? It got real funky, literally, in New York, right? Okay, so that's the way nature would be. So nature doesn't take no days off. Only fools and Negroes. Okay, so two, coming into being, coming forth. That's the second level. The third level is the spiritual level. Now, you get the Egyptology books on hieroglyphics, and they don't even deal with this because they don't understand that. Their pineal gland is like a raisin. It's all dried up. Your pineal gland is like a grape. It's all juicy and stuff, a little big black grape, and you, you're seeing visions and colors on many dimensions, and they don't even know what you're talking about. You be like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys. <laughs> you know, uh, what, you, what you listening to? They think you got some earplugs in. You ain't got no earplugs in. You just vibing, you know. Okay? Because you are everywhere and nowhere at the same time. They can't even understand that. They can't, they can't even phantom that. They outside of that. The average European Caucasian, by the time they're 13 going through puberty, their pineal gland is calcified. Go check me out. So the spiritual level is that Kepra means that Spiritually, I'm coming into evolving into my mission. And so when Kepper is placed, like, watch here. When a person dies, they put a big Kepper and they put gold around. This is what the nobles do. Yeah, if you were a poor farmer, you didn't get the gold, but you could still get the Kepper. Okay. Gold intensifies. If we deal with metals, uh, copper conducts electricity. Silver metabolizes and keeps things in harmony, vibrating on the pitch it's supposed to be. And gold intensifies. So that's why the thugs is all gold down because it intensifies your thugism. So you ain't a real thug. You got 20 pieces of gold around your neck. You a real thug now. Okay, because it's going to intensify what you're doing. Okay, they don't want no silver. They don't want to be metabolized. They don't want to be harmonizing and stuff like that. You know? You know, and they definitely ain't putting no copper on, you know, because, uh, you know. So, but that's what you need to be into. You have to understand. Gold intensifies, silver metabolizes and keeps harmonic energy, like my eye. And then copper boosts your electric charge, your electrical charge. Okay? If you add magnetic to it and iron, 
then that also helps your flow of energy. So you just gotta do watch out, make sure you got a pacemaker or nothing. Okay. Alright. So three levels. The concrete, the abstract, but what it does, and then the spiritual level. So every word in the Madhu Netra is done like that. To come forth, don't mean just to come towards me. To come forth means to come with the flow of energy. Flow the way the universe is flowing. That doesn't mean that. Look, watch this here. And cheer. Cheer is cheer. I don't care if you got three PhDs. It don't get no deeper than that. Y'all understand that? In ancient Kemet, the Nastu. got as deep as you are. Not only was it a sacred divine stool that everyone needs to sit, but the king ruled through the stool. It's like the Ashanti people, the stool sits on the stool. Well, the Nasut will say, I am the Nasut of the Nasut. I am ruler of the sacred stools. Come on. If somebody told you they was the king of the, uh, the chair, you'd be trying to get away from it. Yeah, okay. You got that. Because the chi has a chi in English. This language is limited. In ancient Kemet, it had many divine levels to it. So everything was on at least three levels. There would be more levels, but that, you only learn that through initiation. Okay? So uh, that's what I'm at. And this is how I got into crystallology here, y'all. The crystals we got outside. If you look at here, look. Lapis lazuli, carnelian, turquoise, the gold, the silver, Blue lace agate, emerald. All of these are the stones, and they are consistent with representing the energies in your body. Now, let's just uh, come into Kemet. All this, I was just setting up Kemet. Uh, now, I just want to talk about what is it is in ancient Kemet. First of all, y'all been told the wrong thing again. Every time y'all talk about kings and queens, let me say this. In Kemet, in the Hopi Valley, we had no kings and queens. That's a concept outside of our paradigm. The ruler in ancient Kemet was called the Nasut. And then when he ruled both lands, <coughs> he was called the Nasut Biti. Not Pharaoh. Pharaoh was some Greek word. It comes from the word per-ah. Brother Kava broke down how the word Egypt was a misnomer of Hikapata. Well, Pharaoh comes from the word per-ah, the great house. You don't call the ruler. Obama is the president of the United States. When he comes in, you don't go, oh, they go to White House. No, you said that's President Obama, Barack Obama. Okay? You don't call him the White House. No one called the ruler in ancient Kemet the per ah, the, the, the great house. You called them by their name. They were the Nasut Bitti. Every ruler had at least five names. He had a birthing name. He had a Haru name. He had a golden Haru name. Then he had a Nasubiti name, and then he had a Sa-Ra name. Sa. Ra. So these two names will be put inside of a shin. A shin is an elliptical orbit that shows that the ruler ruled every place that the sun shone. That the sun was shining and it rose and set. How many people call this a cartouche? That's French. It means a cartridge, a bullet. Because that's what it looked like when the French saw it. Don't call those sacred symbols a cartouche, a French name. It's a shin. S H N. Or you can put a little E in there and you can't pronounce it. A shin. So, the Sara and the Nasupiti will be placed inside of a shin. The Sara is the son of the sun. Everybody who went to the temples in ancient Kemet regarded, that's why all the 
the early Hebrews, early Christians, they got that halo around them. That meant they went to the temples in ancient Kemet. It had nothing to do with those theological stuff. No, it meant that they studied in Kemet at the sacred temples, and they were sons and daughters of the sun. Take that mysticism out of it. Okay. Sons and daughters of the sun. So the, the ruler recognized that one of his names is he was the son of the sun. His other name is Nasut Bitti. Remember we talked about the cobra and the vulture, Nekabet and Wajet? Well, Nasut, the south, Bitti, the north. The north is where the grapes and the wine and all of that was. So that's where the bee was.